Uh, well, welcome everybody to today's first lecture. Um, we're very, very pleased indeed to have Caroline Lucas MP, um, the Green, Green Party MP, representing the, the party that if you look on Animal Aid website, you'll see has uh, an excellent, excellent policy for animals. Um, she's the, also the Vice Chair of Parliament's Cross-Party Animal Welfare Group, to, to support that point. Um, she will be taking questions uh, at the end. Um, so we're uh, to put your hands together. Uh, can I look? Wow, well it's amazing to see uh, so many people full in this room and full right throughout this wonderful animal fair. Each time I come it seems to get bigger, so that's just uh, amazing. And, um, you just said Richard, I was going to give a lecture. That sounds slightly scary. I'm not going to give a lecture. I'm just going to have a quick ramble over the uh, last few years in Parliament, if that's all right. So essentially, I was just going to, uh, to look back to what's been happening in Parliament over the past few years when it comes to animal protection. Um, so I'm only going to speak for 10 minutes or so, but very happy to take questions on that or on anything else that, um, that, that you want to uh, raise. So please do feel free to, to raise anything that you like. But essentially, I wanted to start by paying tribute to animal aid. <coughs> And to really just say that whenever there's a key issue in Parliament, then you can guarantee that Animal Aid will be there leading the way. And as supporters, you play a really important part in terms of the contribution that you make to trying to ensure that we can live in a world that is free from animal cruelty. And I just want to say a bit about what I've been trying to do in Parliament to do that very same thing as well. And there have been some really high profile animal rights campaign since I was elected in 2010 and perhaps one of the most visible of those has been the fight against badger culling. It's been a battle that's seen those of us on our side deploy the science, the evidence. We've deployed celebrities and big haired amazing rock stars. We've deployed teams of badger vaccinators and direct action. We've taken to the streets as well as the country lanes in defence of a much loved iconic species of wildlife. And for their part, the government has deployed, well, they've deployed Owen Patterson. Uh, the man, of course, who famously blamed the badgers for moving the goalposts. A statement that underscores his complete lack of understanding of badger anatomy, uh, as well as an almost ideological obsession with doing anything and everything to deny the evidence in front of his own eyes. In Parliament, I was very pleased to be part of the team that secured a major backbench business debate on the government's culling strategy. And in my opening speech, I said this, I said, today's motion calls on the government to stop their ill-judged, unscientific, and deeply unpopular policy of culling. Not just for a few months, but completely. The motion is about an abandonment of the cull, not just a postponement. And that's why it's so important that today's debate goes ahead. That's what the majority of the public want. It's what the science demands. Public opinion overwhelmingly opposes a badger cull, including in those regions where the pilots are due to take place. And of course, the government is not interested in the, the science, they're not interested in the evidence, and they're certainly not interested in public opinion. Many of you will know that a majority of MPs did vote for that motion to stop the cull and to implement more sustainable and humane solutions, including both the vaccination programme for badgers and increasingly for cattle as well, along with improved testing and biosecurity. But as I say, the government doesn't care about what MPs think, not even when they're MPs of their own party. They don't care what the public thinks and they don't care what the scientific experts tell them. And so despite a number of subsequent debates in Parliament, hundreds of parliamentary questions, um, many uh, absolutely exposing the flawed basis of the culling trials and the spiralling costs, Despite that growing public opposition, despite the positive outcomes from Wales where they're committed to alternatives to culling, despite those early day motions, um, the questions, axed ministers and much more, the coalition scandalously remains committed to badger culling as a way of controlling bovine TB. We, on the other hand, are committed to continuing to point out why they are so fundamentally wrong to try to hold them to account, including over why they fought two legal battles to try to avoid independent scrutiny, over why this year they did away with the independent panel, which would have allowed peer scrutiny of the culls, presumably because ministers were rather afraid of what peer scrutiny of the culls would show, and over the fact that this year there's been absolutely no attempt to count badges in the cull areas, either before or after the culls. 
The time taken for badgers to die an excruciating death was not recorded, and there's been no oversight by independent scientists. Instead, the effectiveness of the culls has been judged on key data collected by the marksmen themselves. Remember that in 2013, just last year, the data that was collected by the marksmen was so unreliable that it was considered completely unusable by the independent expert panel, which is probably another reason that they got rid of the independent expert panel. So I've been trying to hold the government to account too over the decision not to issue any report this year on the so-called humaneness of the culls, meaning that they have no proper means of assessing how, how quickly the, the, the badgers died, despite that being one of DEFRA's stated objectives. And over the numbers of badgers actually culled compared to the targets, as well as on the impact on badger numbers overall, and on bovine TB rates, there is really no government evidence because they've not been measuring it possibly, possibly properly. Bovine TB cost the taxpayer £91 million pounds in 2010-11 in the testing, in the slaughter of animals, in the, and in the compensation to farmers. <coughs> Excuse me. DEFRA warned that that cost could rise to £1 billion pounds over the next decade if the disease is left unchecked. It is undoubtedly a huge problem, but it is even more, that's what makes it even more irresponsible and unfair to gamble as this government is doing with farmers' livelihoods and with the future of one of our best-loved wildlife species. We need more and more people to continue to shine a light on the problem and, crucially, on the related issue of animal husbandry. And it's fair to say, I think, that the official opposition has been quite strong in its stance on the badger culls, and I've worked quite closely with MPs like Labour's Angela Smith to keep the issue on the political agenda. But there's also an urgent need to tackle the underlying causes of the spread of bovine TB, and that means being bold enough to point the finger as well at intensive farming. And I'm here to say that very sadly, there are very few MPs who are prepared to do that as well. Biosecurity, controls on cattle movement, and comprehensive vaccination of both cattle and badgers are important, but they only get us so far. More and more experts are talking about the way in which modern husbandry practices, <coughs> in other words, incredibly intensive farming, places chronic stress on those intensively farmed animals. And a number of scientists are also pointing to the way in which cattle have been inbred for many years as a significant contributor to why cattle don't have the resistance to cope with a disease like bovine TB. And so that's why it's so important that I think Animal Aid and others do broaden and have broadened that campaign, not just to be looking at badger culling in isolation, but to see it as part of the overall mechanised, intensified farming that is still practised in this country, and which, scandalously too, the government is trying to export to other countries, to developing countries, suggesting that intensive agriculture is the way for them to go as well. We know that intensive agriculture is appalling for the animals concerned, but it is also increasingly adding to the costs of farmers. And so if the government isn't going to be persuaded by an argument based on compassion and humanity alone, then one might have thought that at a time of austerity they might just be driven by uh, arguments around the economics of this. Sadly, it seems as if that ideological obsession with the intensification of agriculture is so great that even when it's leading to greater economic costs, as well as very real costs for the animals themselves, that doesn't seem to be enough to move the, the government to change on this issue. That's why, as, as a Green MP, I'm proud to be an advocate for policies that I believe really will protect animals that really will get to the root of the problem, that really will target intensive farming as an absolutely critical part of this battle. I think it's important as well when we look at this issue to see it in the overall round of, of the issue of exploitation of, of, of animals. And I wanted to mention just a few other uh, battles that are going on that you'll know about very well too because you're involved in many of them, I know. But one of them, for example, is on the use of wild animals in circuses. And again, I'm afraid this is a tale of governments ignoring evidence and ignoring the will of Parliament and certainly the will of the wider population. Because some of you will remember that the Coalition promised to take action on this issue. The government's own public consultation showed 94.5% of the public want to ban on wild animals and circuses. MPs have voted on one. I happened to see David Cameron the other day outside Downing Street. I was there with Peter Tatchell and a number of others. Uh, with a pledge, we're handing it into number 10, reminding them that they had promised that legislation would be forthcoming. And I actually had a quick word with David Cameron as he walked in. I don't often get the chance to have a word with David Cameron. But as he walked in, I said, have you remembered your promise on this issue? And he, and he absolutely assured me that he had. Well, that's, that's, that just shows what that is. 
works, doesn't it? Because I sat on the edge of my seat during the last Queen's speech, uh, expecting to hear this bill that he had promised, but again, nothing. No, no bill to ban the use of wild animals in circuses, and so circuses continue their cruelty. The MP Jim Fitzpatrick has presented his own bill. He's been drawn quite high up in the list of private members' bills. And so he's trying to get the similar thing achieved via yet another private members' bill, and of course I support that. But the archaic rules of the House of Commons means that that proposal is constantly blocked essentially by the same three Conservative MPs who are filibustering, talking it out, basically trying to stand in the way of democracy and certainly standing in the way of animal rights. I think it's a scandal, frankly, that they are still allowed to do that, and one of my priorities alongside animal rights is very much about trying to reform Parliament, so you don't have the absolutely appalling vision of three <coughs> male Tory MPs yeah. talking a whole load of rubbish, more rubbish than usual, in order to stop, in order to stop the democratically uh, you know, mandated will of Parliament and something, as I say, that has nearly 95% of the public on side as well. Ironically, one of the things that these same three backbenchers are trying to achieve, they don't like other people's private members' very much, private members bills very much, but they do want one on um, EU membership, and specifically on trying to withdraw from the EU. And it's quite interesting because, of course, the UK is increasingly out of kilter with many EU member states who have already banned the use of wild animals and circuses. And it may well be that actually the EU route is going to be the most effective one to try to finally make sure that we in this country catch up with the rest of them in this 21st century. Because one of the experiences I had when I was a member of the European Parliament, I was very active on trying to ban the um, import of seal products. Um, and one of the ways we managed to get the ban on the import of, of, of seal products was on the grounds that a majority of individual member states had actually come up with their own legislation, which meant that there was a lack of harmony across the EU member states because there were different regulations in different member state countries. And, <coughs> and it was actually that that persuaded the Commission to act on this issue rather than the, the overwhelming um, position based on, 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 on opposing animal cruelty. But if on the same issue of wild animals and circuses, we can point to a, a disharmony of different um, regulations in different member state countries, that might be another way in which we can push to see an end to the use of wild animals in circuses. So we will continue to try to, to press for that. I've talked in some detail about <clears throat> those two examples, but I also wanted to give you a quick flavour of some of the other uh, work that I've been doing uh, in Parliament to help to protect animals. Many of you will have taken part, I know, in protests at ports like Ramsgate, where I've also joined demonstrations against live exports. I was pleased to be one of a cross-party group of MPs that secured a debate that called on the government to change existing legislation and to allow ports like Ramsgate the freedom and the independence to refuse that trade. On animal testing, I've been working hard to hold the government to account over its promise made in the coalition agreement to reduce the number of experiments. I'm in the European Parliament, I was proud to be part of a, of a, of a group of, of MEPs who were pushing for a complete end to the use of animal experiments. We've got to keep that on the agenda, even if on the way there are the steps to be, to be taken in that direction. I've been a vocal campaigner on maintaining the ban on hunting with dogs. Next week I'm part of a big lobby organised jointly by the RSPB and organisations like the League Against Cruel Sports. I'll be reaffirming my commitment to strengthening the Hunting Act and making the case for more to be done to enforce the law properly, and also to try to stop cases being taken against animal charities that have had the courage to stand up to the uh, hunters. We'll know, you'll know that uh, they've been trying to um, bring organisations like the RSPCA and others to, to court. Um, we ought to be accusing the hunters of breaking the law, not the animal charities. I've also demanded to ministers that they take action to control the sale of puppies in pet shops and over the internet, against shark finning, hair coursing, the use of whips in horse racing, which I know is a key animal aid campaign, and about the sentencing of those who organise animal fighting. And that's mainly been done through things like letters to the ministers, parliamentary questions, and of course early day motions. And I just wanted to say a word about early day motions, because many of you may well have taken the action of calling on your MPs to sign uh, early day motions, and some of them will tell you that it's a complete waste of time. And some of them will have a policy that they're very proud to say they don't sign early day motions, which seems to me very strange. There's one of the few tools as a backbench MP that you have, and you say, well, I can't be bothered to do that, and I'm not going to sign them. It is true to say that an early day motion does not lead to a debate on the floor of the House, and it's a great shame that they don't. But that doesn't mean to say that they're not useful. If you manage to get 
a hundred or more MPs signed up to an early day motion. That does put pressure on the government, it does force them to respond to it, and it does give you a way of engaging with your MP and asking them to do something. And so if you do have an MP who's chosen to give away one of the few tools they have as a backbencher, and say they don't sign EDMs, then ask them to write a letter on the same issue as the EDM. If they don't want to show their support by signing the EDM, they can just write to the minister making the same point. Because nothing makes me more angry than an MP pretending that they actually support this thing, but then failing to do anything to demonstrate that support. So if you invite them to sign the early day motion, if they don't want to, okay, fine. Well, what else are they going to do to take forward that issue? I don't think we should give up by them just being able to say that it doesn't uh, in itself make a difference. 177 MPs, I'm proud to say, have signed an EDM inspired by Animal Aid's campaign to get CCTV installed in slaughterhouses. Again, that's something that 87% of the public want to see the government act on. And although that's a high level of support, it's a very high level of support actually for an EDM, on its own, it probably won't shift ministers and won't ensure the government starts to feel the weight of that 87% of the public who want action. So we need to be looking at other tools as well. What I've learned from being in the House of Commons is that <laughs> change happens when a range of different forces come from different angles to try to get the same thing achieved. So the CCTV EDM in Parliament is usefully backed up by sustained pressure on the supermarkets and that's resulted in every single major supermarket in the UK insisting that their suppliers install independently monitored CCTV cameras in their slaughterhouses. And so huge congratulations to Animal Aid and everyone who's made that possible. exciting as well to see Animal Aid's public petition in support of this same thing, in support of CCTV and slaughterhouses. This is a petition on the Number 10 website and if you haven't signed it, please do and encourage others to. Um, because if you get 100,000 signatures on that Number 10 website petition, then that can trigger a debate in Parliament um, and that would be again another way of putting pressure on the government on this issue. And when I checked Yesterday, we were more than halfway towards that 100,000. So once it gets a bit of momentum behind it, you can actually get that number without that much difficulty. So please do um, uh, encourage others uh, to do that as well. Because together, we can secure a commitment for, from whoever forms the next government to take that small step that will make a big difference and help prevent people deliberately abusing animals in slaughterhouses. Because anyone who's seen the video uh, on, on Animal Aid's <coughs> website about the gratuitous and hideous abuse of animals in slaughterhouses will know that there is an incredibly strong case for taking action against it. And to close, I just want to say uh, a few words about the All-Party Animal Welfare Group of Parliament, of which I'm a, a Vice Chair, and it's really encouraging that the group does have active membership from right across the different political parties. In recent months, the group's been very focused on the welfare of companion animals. I mentioned earlier that I've done some work on the control of the sale of kittens and puppies, and that campaign was driven in large part by the TV vet Mark Abrahams, who also happens to be a, a resident down in, in Brighton. And what he's really drawn attention to is sometimes the, the innocence, if you like, of people thinking that they're buying um, you know, a, a lovely little kitten or, or puppy, having no idea that they have been basically industrially farmed to, to produce these um, kittens and puppies. So unless you see them being sold alongside their mothers, you have no idea where they've come from. Uh, so that is a, a, a real concern, both for the health of the, of the um, kitten or puppy, uh, but also for uh, the, uh, the, 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 the animals as, as a whole. When we met to discuss proposals for decent regulations that would end this heartbreaking way in which kittens and puppies are wrenched away from their mum so they can be sold, again I suggested that he did start a petition that would trigger the kind of parliamentary debate I was just talking about for the um, CCTV. And we did get over 100,000 signatures on that, and there was a debate, and there is now real pressure to make that happen. The All Party Group has also included regulation of online and pet shop sales in its recent dog strategy, and that includes 21 specific recommendations on dog control, dog breeding, dealing and trading, dog identification, and responsible dog guardianship. The Animal Welfare All Party Group is also currently developing its strategy for 2015, and ideas include work on exotic animals as pets, uh, sentencing for animal cruelty, um, and I'd be very happy to take any of your own um, suggestions back to the group if there are key things that you think that the group should be working on after the next election. That's probably a good point to um, hand over to you for uh, any questions. I just want to end by saying it's a, a huge privilege to be in Parliament and I'm trying to use that position to do everything that I can to bring about greater animal protection 
And it's fantastic to come to a fair like this and just see how much support that position has and just really, um, I think, reaffirms the, the importance of making sure this issue is a really critical issue, particularly coming up to the next election. You know, in all of the discussions about austerity and everything else, it's very easy for these kinds of issues not to be properly debated, and yet they matter to so many people. And I think the number of the people here today demonstrate how much they matter. And if we can make sure that animal rights is a key part of all of the parties' manifestos going into the next election, we might just have a slightly better chance of being able to hold to account whoever does form uh, the next government. So I very much urge you to do that as well. Thank <laughs> you.